one one of the other things that I, that I stole from you, and I, I've literally stolen this presentation a few times and and kind of replayed a version. I saw you talking. I can't remember which conference it was at years ago, um, where you were talking about. I, I think it was about it, it was about the ideas of impact mapping, uh, but but the, the, alluding to the thing that you were just describing of trying to find a way of navigating a route towards a solution and you were making you were you told a funny story about about using you know driving the car with the gps and your gps kind of changing the route and all that sort of thing and and pe poking fun at what you know the difference between the, what we usually call a road map in, in in software terms and what a real road map is like and how we can use it in different dimensions that idea kind of really resonated with me again in terms of this idea in trying to break problems down into smaller steps having some kind of for what of a better better term sort of a fitness function that determines are you closer or further away from your destination and you can pretty much head off in any random direction as long as you've got that fitness function and you discard the steps that move you further away and keep the steps that move you closer you'll get there yes on the topic of books you know it's to, to, to read and um the, the, the one of the most interesting books I've read, um, uh, not, not only recently, but still, I, I consider it one of the most interesting books, is, is Tim Hartford's book, Adapt. Mm -hmm. Tim Hartford is a British economist, and um, it's, it's um, strange for people in our industry to you know, benefit from reading economic books. <laughs> but um, Adapt is a book uh, that kind of the subtitle, if I remember it correctly, we can find it on Amazon later, is, is Why Success Always Starts With Failure. And yeah. it's talking about how linear plans generally fail. If, if you have a, you know, a, a, a sequence of steps, you're uh, uh, hoping that everything will work OK, it, it, will, it will always, always fail. And one of the things he does kind of describe very nicely in the book is um, the, these three principles for designing good plans. He calls them Palczynski principles, and, and that's a wonderful story on its own. Um, but um, he comes up with three principles for plans that are good when you don't have perfect knowledge and when, when the ground is shifting as you're kind of delivering and things like that. And, and the principles are basically uh, variation, survivability, and selection. It's kind of variation mm -hmm. is uh, having, you know, lots of ideas in the plan, not just the minimum of what we're going to do, which is totally opposite of what most people do. We, we, you know, I don't know how many times I've sat in a, in a meeting with must, should, could prioritization, and then yeah. people argue what's a must, what's a should, and 99% and ends as a must. And, and <laughs> kind of, as opposed to that, you know, have, have more, more stuff in the plan than what we are going to implement, because having more uh, options there makes it easy to replan once you need to replan. Like, like, you know, we, you've mentioned this roadmap presentation, and if you look at the roadmap on uh, any Google Maps, so you know, physical maps, there's there's lots of roads on that map that you are not going to take. But knowing yeah. that these roads are there is helpful in case of trouble because yeah. we know what the options are. Then, kind of the second principle he's talking about is survivability, where if one of these ideas turns out to be wrong um, or problematic or things like that, shouldn't really kill the whole thing. And and yeah. You know, of course, that's kind of, and the third principle is, is the principle of selection. But I, I, again, there's kind of tricky terminology. When people hear selection, they often think prioritization of work up front. What he's yeah. talking about selection is kind of brutal evolutionary selection, killing yeah. off stuff that is not supposed to survive, removing stuff from production that doesn't deserve to be maintained, that doesn't deserve to be tested anymore, that yeah. doesn't deserve to be, you know, effort spending on, on stuff. And I think that's the, that's the one that we're really, really bad at as an industry. Uh, you know, variation, uh, usually people have more ideas than they need. Um, survivability, I think 20 years ago, um, we were, as an industry, relatively bad at doing small stuff. Most people yeah. were thinking about, you know, six months, two year projects. Now, most people I meet kind of do stuff that's doable in weeks or, or even days. Yeah. But we are really, really bad at figuring out this selection criteria. How yeah. do we know what's, you know, out of the stuff we've deployed, what's worth keeping? And, and, how do we even decide on that? Especially, again, that brings us back to this question of measuring some value somehow. 
yes. um, in a way that you can actually say, well, this, you know, what I've done this week actually delivered value or didn't deliver value. And, and not just faking it like the people at the BBC did because it matched some abstract requirements yeah. or, mm. you know, ma- measuring some inter- interim step rather than the real value. Matched some person's opinion of, you yeah, know, yeah. Oh, this is nice or blue or, you know. It's one of the, one of the thing one of the ways in which I think uh, I I talk about the same idea is fr- from kind of an engineering point of view is to is to work in in in, in an experimental fashion, and part of what I mean by that uh, there are two key parts. One is predict what the outcome is going to be, and that tells you what to measure. So 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 say you know we're trying to you know increase you know, sign-ups or registrations or something like that. And then that tells you that's what you measure. You, 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 you're going to make, you're going to measure the outcome of that. And that's going to tell you whether that was a good idea yeah, or a bad idea. Exactly. But kind of, you know, when you look at it, so, so um, very often what people do in our industry is measure something that's proportional to effort rather than measuring the outcome. Yes. And, and that's not specific to IT. I mean, I, I, again, on the topic yeah. of books, you know, there, there's a, a wonderful book with a clickbait title called How to Measure Anything by Doug Hubbard, yeah, where yeah. he's talking about business metrics. And, and his conclusion is that in general, you know, people measure what's easy to measure, not what's important. Yeah, yeah. And very often kind of stuff that's proportional to effort is really, really easy to measure. And we end up measuring story points or, you know, function points or some kind of, you know, number of screens or, 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 or stuff like that. And people claim it's value, but it's not. And, and it, it's horribly yeah. misleading. So you have a new book out on, on uh, kind of engineering practices in software development and feedback is, is like one of the core principles there. But if you look at feedback, yeah. most people in our industry approach feedback from a very naive perspective. Like, oh, you know, we're going to put some dashboards yeah. there and measure some shit and, and then, you yeah. know, numbers are going to go up or down and things like that. But the, the, the whole science of feedback is amazing. I've, I've uh, kind of a couple of years ago really got, got into reading about the kind of science of feedback. It's, it's a mm. scientific thing that's been explored for probably 150 years or something like that. And really from uh, kind of the second world war onwards and, and kind of the automation that happened as a result of that and feedback, uh, the, the whole idea of measuring feedback and, and control systems and things like that. Um, the, 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 there are books and books and books about that. And one of the key things, uh, you know, there is establishing the right sensors and, and avoiding sensor poisoning and avoiding oscillations that come from delayed feedback and things like that. And, and in a <laughs> trivial, trivial, trivial example, you know, if you have like a, 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 um, a, a thermometer, but the thermometer is outside, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't really matter how. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> lots of people are measuring stuff that makes no, there's no relation to what they're doing because it's easy to measure. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's the feed, feedback is absolutely central. I think the, the the value of that to being able to do useful work. I I, I seem to remember that that yeah, so the, the first mechanical device that built feedback into it was in steam engines, and you get those funny little balls on two sticks that with the spring that's on a rotating shaft, and the the centripetal force forces the balls out as they go faster and that kind of you know moves a lever which kind of shuts down the the, the amount of power that's going to the, the steam engine because they blew them they kept blowing up their steam engines before they figured that out and stopped that feedback I mean, you know, the mechanical uh, system. putting in putting in feedback system putting in uh, like uh, uh control systems using feedback is, is amazingly amazingly effective and and yeah. you know it's 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 uh uh but at the same time it's not something that should be approached from a kind of naive perspective because you can, no, no. You can get misled very easily. And, and my, my best guess, I wasn't involved in the BBC project, but my best guess is, you know, they did have feedback if it was agile, whatever that meant. Yeah. But they were probably either measuring the wrong things or they were measuring it too late or... Uh, Story the points whole, and code you know, coverage is my bet. <laughs> so, you know, there, there, was, there was feedback. And the irony is once you have feedback, once you have these kind of measurement systems and you're measuring the wrong things, it can be horribly, horribly misleading. You can, you can think you're doing well for a long time. Yeah. And, and just, you know... 
end up faking it until until the, the, the kind of penny drops and, and somebody has to pay the bill. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley, a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>